Welcome everyone. So glad to see you all here. Uh, here's something I've stumbled upon in the past. Uh, a chart, a list of top games by revenue in 2018 and 2019. Uh, let's ignore for a minute the fact that Game for Peace is basically PUBG but for Chinese market. Uh, as you can see, there's 80% of crossover. How do you think they made it? I don't know, but I think it might have to. I, I think it might have to do something with the fact that they all use live operations. Hello, my name is Arthur, and today uh, I will tell you a little bit about live operations. Uh, I used to be a financial expert and live ops designer. Now I'm, now I'm a producer at Ten Square Games and a passionate gamer. I'll begin by explaining what live operations are, then I'll go through various live operation techniques and how to monetize them. Finally, I will end with some tips about planning and live ops metrics. Let's think about how games evolved, how they changed from one of experiences to constantly evolving services. <laughs> Successful live titles focus on understanding the player base, meeting player needs, and maintain maintaining long-term relationships. It's all part of LiveOps. LiveOps is about engaging players and giving them reasons to remain longer in our game. LiveOps are the updates, enhancements, and new content that you bring into your game in the hope of providing players with the feeling of fresh nourishment in order for them to keep coming back to the game. But what do updates, enhancements, and new content look like in practice? Think about events and cosmetic changes. Think about new game modes, new feature releases. Think opportunities for personalized experience. Basically, anything you can add to the mix that increases the feeling of freshness, but without distracting them from the core identity of the game. You might know examples of live operations from popular games like World of Warcraft, League of Legends, Fortnite, etc. Uh, perhaps you even took part in them yourself as players. Here's a great example. Noxus versus Demacia event in League of Legends. Players chose their side of conflict and contributed to the clash of the great rivals. Uh, that was event enjoyed by vast amounts of players worldwide. I was one of them. I also had the pleasure of working as live ops designer at Wild Hunt. That's a hunting game with locations from all around the globe. Uh, let me show you some examples that I have worked with. New location for players to hunt on with new animals, new weapons, so basically, a huge chunk of fresh new content, everything sprinkled with events, championships, and some minor cosmetic changes. How about Oktoberfest? That inspired us to create Huntoberfest, where we introduced a temporary creature from German folklore on one of the locations for players to seek out and hunt. Some of you might recognize the inspiration from World of Warcraft as well. Or even better, Halloween week, where on one of the locations we replaced all animals with their undead counterparts. We replaced entire location and its ambient music with dark, gloomy versions. Uh, we even covered all of the locations in our game with randomly generated pumpkins and tombstones that players could shoot to smash them. The most dedicated player destroyed 600, 716 pumpkins and 4,018 tombstones. A single player. Basically, anything can be your inspiration. Real life events, important occasions for your player base, ancient festivals, moon phases, pop culture. That's a weapon inspired by Ghostbusters. Uh, historic events. That's Lewis and Clark expedition in the United States, or even popular 
themes like steampunk. Looks great, but what about money? Is it profitable? Studios that use live op strategy extend the life of their games and get better return on investments in their development. The longer the game is alive, the more it will earn money. To see the impact live ops can have on the life of the game, let's recall me, let's, let me recall the slide that I began with. Uh, games stayed top two years because of live operations. Uh, as of fourth quarter 2019, live services uh, represented nearly 58% of EA's net revenue, up from 44% a year before. Or from my own experience uh, at Tenscore Games. Wild Hunt is five years old right now, and Let's Fish is 10 years old, and they are both highly profitable. You can use your various life operations as a leverage in order to monetize your players. For example, events that encourage players to spend in-game currency, events that can require players to use specific weapon, or items that can be acquired by purchase. Here is a rifle used in Wild Hunt's Alien Invasion event. Events could, could, require, could reward players for doing something that monetizing can quicken or make it, easy, make it easier for them. Tournaments, championships, tryharding players who always want to be on top, who want to show off and be better than others, will probably be more willing to spend more to get higher than other participants. Here is an example that taught me a lesson. I designed this Gold Rush event, Gold Rush tournament, where players had to spend currency in order to participate. I expected them to make rational calculations and not spend much more than they got back in rewards based on their rankings. Uh, as you see, the top players kind of broke the counter <laughs> by spending collectively 140 million in-game currency. Login calendars. We all know them. How about an offer for a player that skipped a day or two with, for example, chest of time that will help him get back on track with his hunting calendar progress? Battle passes. They can have extra levels. They can have extra level or levels, plural, with extra rewards that can be purchased. Very often players also have the ability to boost the progress of the battle pass, like on this example from Diablo Immortal. Cosmetic changes, vanity items, they don't give any advantage to the players, but you can earn by selling them possibilities to, to show off. Here is a great example from Wild Rift. Champion skins, map skins, emotes, poses, recall animations, icons, icon borders, etc. New content. Paying players might be interested in getting content earlier or easier than other. Promotions and bundles. Bundles of items can be used at the same time with all of the above examples to match players' needs. For example, when you introduce new content into your game that improves players' scores, how about selling that equipment bundled with other useful stuff for the players? Because the paying players probably will be willing to spend money in order to get through your new content as soon as possible. Once again, is it profitable? That really depends on your game. You need to calculate how much does it cost to deliver such things to your player base and how much can you earn by doing that. But if you ask me, I would say yes. Here is a revenue chart, chart um, that I marked revenue peaks and corresponding live, op live operations that we've made at the time. In order to, prof in order to optimize your profit, you, you need to do two things. You need to plan it and you need to know who you are targeting with your operations. In order to know that, 
you need to segment your players because only between two and six percent of players bring 95 percent of revenue from in-app purchases different segments may require different approaches and different prof and bring different profits here is an example of different offers with different prices targeted at different segments of players while every player is unique similarities and trends often appear among groups of players segmenting groups and seg segmenting groups is, an, is a necessary step to deliver best content to the most players most popular among free to play games is dividing players into segments based on how much they are spending a good starting point to segment players is a basic funnel as seen on, on the slide for example, you can define some simple segments like this. New players, anyone up to level 10. Non-spenders, over level 10 but never paid. Spenders, paid between 0 and $100. High spenders, paid more than $100. Once you do this, it's easy to track your progress, getting players to move through the funnel from one segment to the next. Once you've defined the most important segments, you will want to be able to treat players in each of those segments differently. You might show different bundles for purchase to each segment to encourage them or only show in-game ads to non-spending players. You can also use those segments to target players differently with your other operations. But when it comes to planning, LiveOps Calendar, when done correctly, has the power to be home to all your plans, shelter to, you, to all your ideas. For all of its utility, its actual physicality as low key is as low-key as they come. From what I learned, and not just from Tenscore Games, but from what I learned about other companies, most LifeOps teams use Google Sheets as their calendar framework, which makes way, things way easier than having to figure out some complex new system. What can you put into your calendar? Day-to-day -day events of different types and durations, battle pass seasons, PVP seasons, new content releases, sales, discounts, promotions. You can use some major real-world events and present them in your game differently. For example, with different loading screens, event banners, and so on. Here you can see example from Let's Fish. Different events and how they synchronize, overlap with other events, sales, discounts, and new content. For some, it might sound weird, but you can also include paydays of different nationalities, especially if they are a ma ma majority in your game. This is an, op an optional and more subjective to each game's regional attachments, but it reminds you to keep an eye on your demographic commerce schedule. When do they have more money to spend? And when are they tightening their wallets? Timely, in-depth performance data helps you understand players and deliver content they will love. Here are some common LiveOps metrics. These metrics can be used to learn more about player behavior track the impact of changes, and measure the performance. These insights needs, need to be turned into a continuous cycle of improvement. When the data tells you that a particular live, ops, oper, live operation, live ops feature, is driving a particular metric, don't take it for granted. Learn from it and direct your efforts to double down on these successes. Just as importantly, do not be afraid to cut poorly performing events, bundles, etc. It may be hard to remove something that you have put so much energy and time into, but only by being ruthless, you will help game in the long run and, sa and it will save you wasting resources on lost causes. Of course, an intuition built up from experience plays a big part in analysis. Data is nothing without a human interpretation. Looking at what I just showed you, I recommend using live operations in order to help your players enjoy your game for longer 
In the meantime, your titles will earn more, and it's also great fun for the life of Steam. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, how do you fight or need to fight with uh, pay to win? Uh, like, your non spenders community that's shouting, oh, pay to win events, pay to win events. Do you have something like this? Or <coughs> no, because basically, pay to win events is uh, basically paying players is how you keep your game alive for so long. Yeah, yeah, but no, but still, you have a big community and they are not. Yeah, you need to consider it for sure. Yeah, that, that's why you need, to, you need to balance it out. Because if you, for example, uh, tell them to, to pay everywhere, you will so, soon not have any players to, to play. Uh, well, when it comes to this event, uh, it was like the, the task was to use your in-game currency that you could gain by free, free to play, but you could purchase, for example, some gold packs. So yeah, free to play players could also participate in it. And if they did, for example, accumulated vast amounts of in-game currency, they could reach the top. But it was, of course, easier for the ones that just purchased the, the currency. Uh, I don't think we, ha we had any backlashes because uh, I think players, when they enter our game, and it's not a cheap game, I need to, I need to, to say that uh, openly. I think they already know it, they expect it, uh, they've seen it through years, so it's nothing new to them. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, as someone who recently started taking care of uh, life ops, what should I avoid at all costs? What mistakes should I uh, avoid? Uh, when you started to ask these questions, the first thing that came to my mind is when anyone tells you that they are sure of anything. Okay. Always in doubt. Uh, even if you checked something mm -hmm. once and you're already like, it was a year ago, mm -hmm. your game might have changed. Mm -hmm. Your community, your players might have changed. Mm -hmm. You're in a whole different moment of the game, of its life. And perhaps it's a good idea to check it again, because mm. what didn't work one, two years ago might work right now. Okay. So always doubt anyone who says that's for sure. Will do, thanks. And uh, one more question, if I may. Uh, what turned out to be the most prof profitable, what was the best call that you did with uh, Live Ops? Was it some kind of event, some kind of tournament? Uh, I think, as, as shown on, on this example, my, my best call as a live ops designer was uh, a Christmas, Christmas event, uh, where we introduced, uh, just like with the Hunterberfest, the temporary creature, that was basically a snowman, mm -hmm. jumping around a location that we additionally, additionally covered with snow. Uh, we've sma we have smashed uh, Santa Claus's slate into the lake. Uh, put some uh, ornaments on the trees and players could shoot the snowman and there, there was also introduced a, a new weapon, uh, basically a gun covered with gingerbread and I think it was, like you see, the, the best selling and the, the most profitable. Uh, 
And I think the, the live ops team really enjoyed it mm -hmm. because what, what I can recall from that time, it was, I think, two years ago, was that we have all done it before the Christmas. So there was no crunch just before Christmas mm -hmm. to release it. We were sure like a, a week before Christmas, we already knew that everything is on track. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one question. What, what is your time frame for releasing content for um, real life events like Christmas? Do you plan it for like a week ahead or two weeks before Christmas? Uh, that really depends on how much do you want to, um, to bring into the game. Because if you want to, for example, use the content that you already had a year or two years ago, you can basically do it in one, year, one week. But if you want to introduce something new, uh, especially if it takes, uh, for example, 3D, 3D graphics, animations, uh, some bigger changes, uh, then I would say plan it at least, I don't know, three months ahead, but start developing it later and make sure that it's all on track, like I said, a, a month, a, a week before. Okay, thank you. And uh, maybe the same question in, in, in another way. When do you release those contents? It's like, a, let's say we have Christmas, it launches a week before or earlier, so later? Uh, actually, when there is some major real life event like Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, uh, and it's happening, for example, on, on, during weekend, uh, we tend to release the content on Friday. Because we, we, don't, uh, we don't want to make it too early and you don't want to be too late. So if it's possible, we want to be right, right at, the, at, the, at, the, at the event, right at the, at the special day. Uh, but additional answer to your uh, first questions, because I just recalled that we have just recently started developing things for uh, this year's Halloween. So yeah, we've started to, to develop them uh, in September. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you all. One more question. I'm wondering, do you have any thoughts about the optimal life of the event duration so that people more people can participate, but it isn't too long, so they don't get the uh, I can bring you a fresh, fresh example, because one of our live ops designer just tested it two weeks ago, and uh, he created an event that had a 24-hour duration. And we got feedback from our players that it's too short because uh, some of them don't play every day, but for example, every second day. And uh, default setting for our events is 48 hours, so two days. Uh, from what I recall two years ago, I tried to do it other way and extend it to three days, so 72 hours. And from what I can recall, it was two years ago, so like I said, someone should check it again. But from what I recall, players said that uh, there was just too much happening in the uh, events window. So I think two days was best option for us at the time. Thanks again.